Hello, I'm Jacob Kruger, and this is the Write Your Screenplay podcast. As you know, on this podcast, rather than looking at movies in terms of two thumbs up or two thumbs down, we look at movies and we look at screenplays in terms of what can we learn from them as screenwriters. We look at good movies and we look at bad movies. We look at movies that we loved and movies that we hated. And today we're going to be talking about a genre of movies that I affectionately like to call the big dumb action movie. And the big dumb action movie we're going to be talking about today is Furious 7. But we're going to talk about it in a way that's hopefully valuable to you, not only if you're a big action movie writer, but also if you're a writer of any other genre. If you're writing a thriller, if you're writing a comedy, if you're writing a drama, even if you're writing an independent film or an art film. In an odd way, big dumb action movies and super experimental art films actually have a lot in common. And the reason that they have a lot in common is that they both exist in a world of expressionism. Oftentimes, when young writers sit down to write a movie, they think that most movies take place in the world of realism. And this is simply not true. There are very, very few movies that take place in the world of realism. The reason few movies take place in the world of realism is because movies happen fast. Movies happen in an hour and a half. And we want our characters to go on profound journeys in an hour and a half. And it's very hard to get those journeys if we're working in the world of realism. So most movies don't take place in the world of realism. They take place in the world of naturalism, which is a slightly heightened version of reality. In naturalism, we never order the meal. The waiter just knows what we want. We never pay for a meal. We always have the exact change. In realism, your friend says something really funny, and three hours later on the ride home, you think of the perfect response. And in naturalism, your friend says the funniest thing, and you immediately respond with the funniest possible answer, and then your friend responds with the answer that tops that. In realism, we make the same mistake again and again and again until finally one day we turn around and say, you know what, I think I want to do this differently this time. But in naturalism, we get the worst possible version of that mistake in the very first scene and then start changing immediately in profound ways. Naturalism is a lot like realism, but it's slightly heightened, so that your movie can happen faster, your character can change faster, and more importantly, so your movie can be more compelling or interesting for your audience. What's wrong with realism? Well, you know those conversations you have with your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, or wife? Those conversations take place in realism. You know when you're going around in the same circle for six hours until neither of you can even remember what you were arguing about? You don't want to be in that scene, and you certainly don't want to be in that movie. Imagine if you did capture that in a movie exactly the way it played out in realism. How boring it would be to watch, how completely redundant. So one of the reasons why we move to naturalism is because naturalism helps us distill those real emotion, those real moments, those real journeys that we go through in our real life, down to their essence, down to that one line that made you cry or made you smile rather than the ten lines that surrounded it. It helps us distill it down to that one action which can really reveal who you are as a character rather than the 15 other things you also happen to do that day. Most movies, whether it's an independent film, a drama, a romantic comedy, they take place in the world of naturalism. Even most thrillers take place in the world of naturalism, and that it's a world where we can accept it as reality, even if it's events that play out differently than in our real lives. And you can see even a lot of sci-fi takes place in the world of naturalism. Not necessarily the world we know, but a world that we can accept as possible and real. Action movies, on the other hand, rarely take place in naturalism. Action movies take place in a land called Expressionism, and this is a more heightened form of writing, even more heightened than naturalism. This is a more heightened form of performance. This is a more heightened form of art. In naturalism, we boil down the real emotions to their essence, but we present them in a way that feels real, even though it's heightened. In Expressionism, the feeling of reality is no longer important. In Expressionism, we are heightening events to a level that goes beyond the real. It's a heightened view of life, a more extreme view of life. 
In experimental films or art house films or in independent films, expressionism is usually used to externalize some internal emotions that we truly do feel in reality. It's used to bring that thing out that's inside of us that we feel but don't want to say or that we feel but that we wish we could say. You can think of the expressionism that was used in Beasts of the Southern Wild, how those beasts were an expression of the feelings inside of that little girl. There's also a beautiful example of expressionism in a, the theater version of The Cider House Rules by Peter Parnell. It's a totally naturalistic play. Those of you who have seen the movie know the movie was also totally naturalistic, except there is this one sequence of expressionism where the adoptive father in that piece is an ether addict and he spends the whole the whole play sniffing ether out of a mask and you've experienced this whole play in naturalism but during his death scene he takes that ether mask and he puts it on his head like a cap and he does this beautiful dance number that for me was one of the most beautiful things i've ever seen on stage it's a dance number where he dances off in this ethery haze to his death, the reason that it works, even though it's not real, is because it feels like how he felt. It feels like what it must feel to be addicted to ether, but it also feels like it must feel to finally slip away from all the troubles of his life. In film, we see expressionism in artists like Charlie Kaufman. We see expressionism in movies like Birdman. And curiously, we see expressionism in action movies in big, dumb action movies. In independent film, expressionism is generally used to show or externalize something that's internal and real. In big, dumb action movies, expression is used to externalize something that we want to feel, something that we wish we could feel, to externalize the way that we wish our lives could be. And when you think about it this way, you realize why Furious 7 is breaking box office records. These movies are built on the ideas that we wish for our lives. The idea that we wish to be heroes. That we wish for simple good versus evil. For our lives to be simpler. These movies exist in a world without psychology. Without complexity of human behavior. Where the good guys are good and the bad guys are bad. And we can distinguish between the dark and the light. These movies exist in a world where heroes fight for things like family. And in these movies, we can create a world where we can feel the excitement that we wish for in our own lives. And then come home and feel like the real values of being with our families and our children and our spouses are the most important values of all. These movies exist not to externalize the things that exist inside of us, but to externalize the things that we wish for, the ways that we wish we could be. And you can see this really strongly in Furious 7. So what you need to understand about these movies is that these movies are actually soap operas for men. They capture highly melodramatic story arcs about love and relationships, and the archetypal roles that men and women dream of playing in their relationships. So you start off with a Vin Diesel character who's the alpha male that every person who's ever dreamed of an alpha male dreams of, right? The sensitive brute. The man who's tough enough to win a good street fight, but also is sensitive enough to know that no one can force you to say, I love you. A man who understands the street and understands love. And he's in love with a girl who has a storyline pulled straight out of days of our lives. A woman who's forgotten everything that they've ever been through together, who's forgotten their whole relationship, who's even forgotten that they're married, based on a bunch of events that happened in the prior movie. And she's now embarking on a journey with a man that she loves but no longer knows. And of course, at that climactic moment, and spoilers ahead for those of you who haven't seen the movie, at the climactic moment, when the evil has been defeated and the love of her life, that strong alpha male is lying, possibly dead. She's the kind of woman who knows what you do is not to resuscitate him, is not to perform CPR. What you do is you tell him the story of your love. The memories that suddenly have come flashing back to you at that moment when you remembered everything and you tell that man if he dies, you die with him. Because the power of love heals all and he will come back to life. This is not naturalism. This is not realism. This is expressionism. 
This is the relationship that we want to have. This is the way we want the world to work. And you can see a similar storyline with the Paul Walker character, Brian, who's going through a related struggle. See, he's the kind of warrior that every person could love. The kind of warrior who longs for bullets and guns and excitement, but loves his children and his wife more. And that's his journey. His journey is to learn that what he's really meant to do is to spend his time with his wife and his child. That that, in fact, is the true journey, the true test of a man. He's yet another sensitive alpha male, a guy who may long for bullets, but in the end is going to be home to tuck his kid in at night. And through the course of the journey that he goes through with his wife and with Vin Diesel's character, we watch these men help each other to be men. We watch Vin Diesel, Dom, teach Brian how to be a man, teach Brian what a real man does and what the challenges in life are. And you can see this is not American Sniper that we're watching, and it is certainly not The Hurt Locker. This is not naturalism, and this is not realism. This is expressionism. But we're also watching a character who's gone through a struggle that most of the audience has probably gone through. That desire to live a life of excitement, that desire to be an action hero that every little boy and a lot of little girls had when they were kids. And now you're finding yourself driving a minivan and you're feeling crappy about your life. And this is the movie that tells you that that's okay. That in fact you are fighting the real battle. That what you're doing is braver than going out and crashing cars and shooting them up. And this is how this movie works as a soap opera for men. It gives you that adrenaline-pumping experience of being that action hero. And then it lets you go to your home, to your family, and realize that that's really what it is to be a man. It allows you to feel good about your life and see things like love and black and white the way you wish they could be. So this is not a movie about complicated relationships, about the troubles of navigating a relationship with a complex woman and a complex man. A man who's haunted by war memories but has a strange desire for them and a woman who, for some reason, is attracted to that. This is a movie where love is pure and real and ultimately conquers all. Where family triumphs, where good defeats evil. This is a little fantasy trip into a big dumb action movie that brings us back to our home feeling the way we want to feel. So action movies in general, and Furious 7 is a prototypical example of it, action movies in general use expressionisms to tell us the story we we want to hear. And that doesn't mean that these stories aren't true in some way. That doesn't mean that there's never been a relationship where love was clear and men chose their families over their desires for adventure. It doesn't mean that love doesn't conquer all. There's a saying that independent movies tell you the truth that you don't want to believe, And commercial movies tell you the lie that you do. And sometimes this is true. But the best commercial movies don't tell you the lie that you want to believe. The best big dumb action movies tell you the truth that you want to believe. The difference is that because these action movies exist in the world of expressionism, Often it becomes a lot less important whether it looks real, whether it seems real or sounds real, whether everybody's talked like this before, whether an action hero in the middle of the battle of his life has time to pop out that perfect quip, whether bad guys can't shoot and good guys somehow can. Now, I'm not saying that that's good, and I'm not saying that's bad. In fact, some of my favorite action movies have transcended that problem. If you listen to my podcast on Guardians of the Galaxy, that's an action movie that I feel transcends the problem of not feeling real because the characters emotionally are played with a great deal of truthfulness. Even though it's a ridiculous comic sci-fi, even though it takes place in a world that's so different than our own. So if you're writing an action movie, this doesn't mean that you should just throw anything real or anything truthful out the window. But if given the choice between the two gods, you need to know which god to serve. In an independent film, in a drama, in a thriller. You've got to serve the god that makes it feel real. But in a big dumb action movie, you've got to serve the god that tells us the story that we want to hear. That affirms our lives. And most importantly, that gives us the excitement that we desire. And the reason that you need to do that is because big, dumb action movies cost a lot of money. They cost hundreds of millions of dollars to make and market. They are a huge risk. And when the numbers get that big, 
huge audiences are required in order to make your money back. And that's why these action movies cater towards an audience by reaffirming the beliefs that they already want to hold rather than by challenging those beliefs the way an independent film might. But let's just talk for a moment about action because this is the thing you need to know if you're building a big dumb action movie. These movies are built like fireworks shows. They start off with an opening salvo that captures our attention. And then they build and build and build to a crescendo with each action moment outdoing the one that came before. When you're building an action movie, sometimes you have the urge to save the best for last. You come up with, for example, in Furious 7, that scene where you're dropping cars out of an airplane and you're like, this is the most amazing thing ever. I should save it for last. But actually, exactly the opposite is true. You don't save the best for last. You save the best for first. And then you outdo it, and outdo it, and outdo it. And this is not only true in action movies. Think about Seven and how that thriller, which does take place in a relatively naturalistic world. Think about those seven murders and the seven acts of that film. Think of how each murder seems so horrific that it could never be topped and yet was topped and topped and topped again. I call this feeding the genre monster. Audiences go to movies because they want a genre experience, and if you give them that genre experience, you can get away with pretty much everything else. The genre experience is the way that the movie makes the audience feel. If you're writing an action movie, then that movie better make the audience feel thrilled, get their adrenaline pumping, and at the end of the day, better leave them feeling like their lives are okay. If you fail to do that, your action movie is taking a huge risk because you're basically doing a bait and switch in your, on your audience. You're saying, you came for that, but I'm gonna give you this instead. And if you do that, they will eat you alive. On the other hand, if you serve the genre monster and give them the emotional feeling that they want, then you can get away with just about anything. For example, you could make a movie like Avatar, which for all its problems, pretty miraculously, manages to get an American audience to see things from the Iraqis' perspective. To make an American audience see the Iraq war from the point of view of the Iraqis, that's a pretty amazing thing in a big dumb action movie. And the reason that James Cameron gets away with it in Avatar is because he's feeding the genre monster in every other way. Similarly, in Fight Club, despite all its weirdness and madness of making a Buddhist movie about fighting, an anti-capitalist and anti-consumerist movie about fighting, Fight Club feeds two genre monsters. Number one, a lot of really thrilling fight scenes and action sequences. And number two, an ending that makes you feel like for all that, Love is possible. And just look at what they get away with. And this is the interesting things about dealing with big budget action movie producers. In general, they don't give a crap about what your movie is about. They don't care about your theme. They don't care about your message. They care about delivering the genre experience that they need to fill those seats. Feed the genre monster and they will let you get away with anything. But you fail to feed that monster. You write the thriller that isn't scary, the action movie that isn't exciting, the comedy that isn't funny, and they will eat you alive. And this is one of the powers of action movies. This is one of the reasons that action movies are worth watching and worth exploring, because these movies are seen again and again and again by millions of people. And a big group, a great big portion of their audience is young and at a very impressionable time in their lives. And in this way, these movies can actually change the way that we see the world. These big, dumb action movies have a profound ability to affect our society. Now, I am not saying that Furious 7 brought about a huge social change in its audience. But if it had wanted to, it certainly could have. And if you're an action movie writer, you need to realize that you do have a responsibility you're shaping the worldview of a huge audience. You need to realize that a lot of that audience is really young and impressionable, and your movie is going to be influencing 
the way that they see the world, the way that they humanize or fail to humanize other people, the way that they see both sides of an argument or fail to see both sides of an argument. Whether you're writing a big dumb action movie or a thriller or a comedy or any other genre, you need to know what your genre monster is. What's the feeling that the audience is coming for? What's the feeling that you want to feel when you watch this movie? And you want to make sure that in each of your acts, you are serving that genre monster in a really big way. Building your own little fireworks show. If you're building a soap opera, that's about the emotional tears. It's about tears and betrayal and sex and love. If you're building a comedy, it's about having the highest joke density you can possibly have. And if you do that, you can get away with pretty much anything. And if you're building a movie like Furious 7, then you better have at least seven amazing action sequences and you better build them like a fireworks display. So if you think about the sequences in Furious 7, the first is probably the coolest filmically. And what's really cool about it is that we don't actually see it. When we first start the movie, we're hearing a little monologue from the Jason Stratham character who's in a hospital room with his brother. And it's a monologue about family values and his love for his brother. And it's not until he turns around that we see that the whole room is filled with dead people. That, in fact, the whole hospital is filled with dead people. And as he walks out, he even hangs a staggering guard, a grenade, which blows up the building behind him. This is an amazing vignette for a character. And it's one of those examples of how sometimes the shark in the water is scarier than the shark out of it. That the action sequence that we don't see, the one we imagine, is sometimes more exciting than the one that we do. So we start with an implied action sequence, an opening salvo that brings us into the world of the movie, the world of the antagonist, the danger of the situation. The next action sequence is a fight between the Jason Stratham character and the Dwayne Johnson character, a big fight crashing through glass at the CIA. We have the action sequence in Tokyo that culminates with a game of chicken between Vin Diesel and Jason Stratham and the emergence of the Kurt Russell character and all those scary army people. We have the dropping cars out of helicopter sequence, the road chase sequence, the running on the top of the bus sequence. And you can see that each of these sequences out does last. And whenever they can, they do something with cars. Because this movie is Furious 7, and it's a seventh installment of The Fast and the Furious. And that's why when we get to the next sequence, we have a car crashing through three buildings. We have a car chase against a helicopter in the streets of Los Angeles with people diving in and out of car windows. We even have a scene where Vin Diesel's car crashes into a helicopter. You can see about every 10 pages or so, or even fewer in this movie, that there's a big old action sequence. And you can see that these sequences are set up almost like video game levels with something called set pieces, where you think of a location and all the possible problems of that location. And then you just concentrate on using things wrong. You don't drive a car, you crash a car through a building, you fly a car into a helicopter. You think about all of the things that could go wrong in an environment. And then you make sure that every single one of them does go wrong. You think of images that we've never seen before, and you think of different kinds of action sequences that outdo the ones that have come before. You save the best for first, and then you outdo it, and outdo it, and outdo it, until you've come up with stuff that even you couldn't have imagined coming up with when you first sat down to write the movie. And you can see that, once again, we're living in a world of expressionism. Dwayne Johnson crashes an ambulance off a bridge directly into a bad guy. Magically. The bad guy shows up magically at all these different places. As if he were not really a person, but like the symbol of that thing that's chasing you. He even shows up on a road that can only be accessed after being dropped off from a helicopter. Magically in some strange car contraption that he seemingly is pulled out of nowhere. He seems, in the context of this movie, to have the God device even before it's captured. These are big, dumb action movies. And although a purist like myself would strive for something more, the most important thing is not the literal reality. The most important thing is the action. If you deliver the action, you can get away with any message you want. 
If you deliver the action and you're interested in real relationships, you can develop real relationships. If you deliver the action and you want to look at the Iraq war, you can look at the Iraq war. If you deliver the action and you want to look at the Patriot Act, as Batman does, and look at the nature of morality, you can do so. If you deliver the action and you want to look at racism, as the X-Men series does, you can do so. But if you don't deliver the action, they will eat you alive. And then it won't matter what you deliver, because no one will see it when your movie doesn't get made. And this is true no matter what genre you're working on. If you're writing a drama and you don't deliver the complex emotional relationships, they will eat you alive. If you're writing a political movie and you don't deliver the sense of outrage, they will eat you alive. You must deliver the feeling that your movie promises. But here's the good news. You get to decide what that promise is. Because the promise you ultimately need to deliver should be the promise that drew you to writing the movie in the first place. The promise that you need to deliver is the thing that would make you spend your $12 to go see that movie. The experience that you want to have and the feeling that you want to leave with. So even though I've laid out these principles of how these action movies are generally constructed, the chances are if you're writing an action movie or a drama or a comedy, then you're already the audience for that movie. And that means that an audience like you also exists elsewhere. That there are other people like you out there in the world who want to see the same movies you want to see. That means if you want to subvert some of these principles or move us through a cauldron of doubt before the moment that affirms our values or affirm our values in a way that sheds doubt, you can do so. You are the audience for your movie. So it's important to understand that the ultimate genre monster you're feeding is not some mysterious them out there. The genre monster you're really feeding is the genre monster in you. What is the feeling that you want to feel when you leave this theater? How are you going to deliver that feeling in each act of your movie? How are you going to save the best for first and get your best stuff out there in front? And how are you going to outdo it and outdo it and outdo it, taking your movie beyond the places we expect it to go, beyond even the places that you imagined it going when you first sat down to write it? I hope that you enjoyed this podcast. If you'd like to study with me in New York City, online, one-on-one, -on -one, or in our international screenwriting retreats, please check out my website, writeyourscreenplay.com.